Okay. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Hello. If everybody would um just lie down just for a few minutes. Well, lie down for the rest of the meeting, I guess. Basically, um, we have a couple of points of business that I wanted to mention. We have elections going on in Farmers Branch, and um, and um, Carrollton. <clears throat> and last month we had all of the candidates except Eddie Lopez in Carrollton. Coming school. So Anna who's on the city council, Mike Dewing, uh, running for a seat on the Anna Polt is running for mayor. He's on city council. Uh, Eddie Dewing, um, Mike Dewing, is running for council, and um, uh, Eddie Lopez is also running for council. And then we have Wes Newt, who's running for Carrollton Farmers Branch. I. Oh, hey, Wes. <laughs> and Wes is running for Carrollton Farmers Branch ISD. He is a he's a lawyer who works for schools and he's a school lawyer and he's running against Randy Shackman who was um, um, a candidate and another candidate who was also to the right. So I would encourage you because the way Carrollton Farmers Branch votes, they have two votes, you give them both to Wes uh, because that will give us a better chance of getting him elected. And Wes is here. And you have signs, Wes, as well? Perfect, perfect. And yes. Oh, yeah, and Brittany Riddell, I'm so sorry. Brittany was here last time too. She's also running for council and she had formerly run for, um, she'd run for a, a house, a Texas house seat, right? Yeah, yeah, she ran, yeah. Anyway, um, so we have a slate in Carrollton, which is great because we haven't always had one. And in Farmer's Branch, we have, um, uh, Jaime, Jaime Rivas running against Terry Lynn. Terry Lynn is, an, is a follower of Tim O'Hare, who was, was the author, for those of you who live in Farmer's Branch, was the author of that uh, bill that uh, they got fined for and paid millions of dollars requiring landlords to check immigration status. So uh, Tim O'Hare has now been elected ju county judge in Tarrant, but uh, Terry Lynn is keeping his memory alive here. So if you can find your way to support uh, Terry Lynn, uh, I mean, excuse me, uh, Jaime Rivas. And so many names, so many names for a blonde woman. Jaime Rivas, and we have a couple of people who are willing to like do a postcard party to start sending out emails. And we as a, we will fund them. We will pay for the postage. And we also are thinking about making a donation to both of those candidates. Because especially Jaime, that's a really big, big seat for us to win. Uh, so that's the... Well, Capel, David Cavanaugh is a Republican, but he supported Julie Johnson. He crossed the line to support Julie Johnson, along with Tracy Fisher. Um, and uh, the woman running against him is only about Pinkerton, and she's been working hard, the Repu working Republican clubs very hard. And Davin Bernstein, who's pretty awful, is supporting her. So I can tell you that. <laughs> other stuff I can tell you privately. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the one other thing we have to do, which is good to be kosher with the bylaws, is we have to have an election. And I sent out a couple of announcements with the slate that we currently have, uh, who are all willing to run again, uh, with the caveat that I've been president for a long time, and if anybody would want to run for this job, and I would give them all the support I could, uh, I would encourage that. But so far, I've, requ I've asked several times, nobody has responded. So our slate tonight, is there anyone here who wants to run for anything? Cowards. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, Horace, Horace is our, um, Horace Blake, who's uh, probably traveling because he's always traveling. He's our secretary. Um, uh, Steve Zadico, who couldn't get the car to come tonight. Uh, he's from Capel. Horace is from Carrollton. He's our treasurer and he does a wonderful job. Um, and uh, Kimmy Robinson from Farmers Branch is our vice president. And then there's me, which is whom you know, right? Because you can't get rid of me. I can't get rid of me. So anyway, um, because there's no other slate or no, no other, anyone else running, I think we can just kind of, like they do with the Dallas, with the party, I mean, the elections in general, if you have, don't have an opponent, they don't even put you on the ballot. But Kurt or Joel, do you have something to say? <laughs> uh, okay. I move that we reelect the correct slate of uh, 
Okay. All in favor? All in, but yeah, basically just go yes. with us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. But I have one member who watches me like a hawk on this on the selection stuff. So I want to make sure it's some of you know him. <laughs> a lot of you know him. But <laughs> um, so we've done the we've done the we've been legal. So now I want to get to the main event tonight, which is Paul. And um, Paul is a really wonderful speaker for us to have the opportunity to listen to. And I sent a lot of bio with the email and it, I could have gone on for two more pages. Uh, he's a commentator on national TV. He's just he's just so accomplished. And apparently according to his wife, he's been doing some really, really preparing for this. <laughs> Not just off the top of his head. So I'm very excited to present Paul. And it's up to you, Paul, whether you take questions in, in the process or questions at the end, uh, whatever works for you. And I'm gonna kind of ask him to stay back in the vicinity of the Zoom if, if he can. Uh, and we have people Zooming as well. And I will, if they have questions, I will ask them. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. I don't know if I can. Paul is louder than I am. I've got a loud oh, voice. So. Well, if you need it here. If you need it here. I'll put it up there. Right. They said they could hear. Oh, they can can, can you hear okay on Zoom? The Zoom people can hear, yes. We hear you fine, but you do need to hear Stephen, you can hear, hear you fine, but adjust Top your head so gone. we can exactly. see your oh. face. There we go. There we Very go. good. You look better that way. Okay. Thanks. Perfect. Awesome. This is going to be difficult for me because I am a trial lawyer, and we sometimes have to speak from the podium. But I, you know, I sort of play it with ranger rules. As long as you can get back to the podium before the judge can throw you out, you're okay. So, yeah. So I usually, I usually roam a lot more than that. But uh, I thought, you know, and and I would welcome questions at any time. I thought I would, you know, talk about about twelve plus or minus uh, issues raised by the latest um, Trump case, and talk a little about the Trump criminal cases. And the first point I'll make is that. I used a plural advisedly. It's going to be, I would say, at least three cases. Could be more, but there are at least three lined up. Uh, and it's not even clear, though, this was the one that was indicted first, that this will be the first to go. Because uh, on the federal side, if there's a federal case filed, uh, they have a speedy trial act that might happen. It's still also very likely that none of these cases will get resolved in the sense of having a jury trial prior to the election in 2024. So uh, Trump doesn't even have another appearance in court until December of this year. So, and there's gonna be all sorts of legal wrangling and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but it's very rare that I agree with Bill Barr on anything but I do agree with him on this. He was just said recently that he thought of the cases lined up against Trump, the one that he thinks Trump ought to worry the most about is the documents case. Uh, I think that's a fairly clear cut case. Uh, they make those kind of cases all the day. False statement to the FBI, false statement to the Secret Service, whoever the, you know, in the course of an investigation, if you make a false statement to an agent, a material false statement, it's a felony, punishable by five years. Every statement is a fresh penalty. And it doesn't matter if you make that statement directly or indirectly. So that's the case that I think if I were on the Trump legal team, which I'm not, I like to get paid by my clients. Um, you know, uh, I'm not saying I'd never represent a, a Republican because I look at that, I've done that in the past a few times. I just look at it as taking money from the Republicans and funneling it to the Democratic candidates. But it would be an interesting uh, uh, problem for them on that, on particularly when you have three cases lined up like that, because they really have to, as I said, kind of run the field on that. Um, I do think, though, that Alvin Bragg has done something which probably lit a fire under the other prosecutors. And I know there's some criticism out there. This isn't the biggest case in the world. It's not the one I would have started with. But, you know, I look at that guy as sort of the guy who sees a, a bridge and it's kind of a rickety bridge and he steps out on the bridge and he doesn't fall through. And so I think he's probably 
to some extent accelerated what happened. All these are independent. These prosecutors are doing it independently. But I think he stepped out and found out that the world didn't come to an end when you indict an ex-president. And I, I think the other two cases are going to follow pretty quickly at this point. As a former federal prosecutor, I can tell you the big case that got away that probably won't be made, not through any lack of criminality, just because of the statute of limitations, are all the tax issues that Trump has had over the years. Uh, there's a statute of limitations, and those cases um, really speak more to the defanging of the IRS. So the IRS was very risk averse, particularly against going against rich people, particularly against going against folks who had very, very strong legal teams. Uh, and the Trump, his father and his family, uh, I think have probably gotten away with a lot of tax fraud that will never come to light because of the statute of limitations. Um, the biggest question that I think, or the biggest surprise I think I had about the indictment was most of the pundits got it wrong. I mean, most of the pundits were saying it's going to be mostly misdemeanors. Um, and the difference between a misdemeanor and a felony is simple. Misdemeanor is punishable by one year or less. Felony is punishable by one year or more. Uh, so most of the pundits thought it would be predominantly misdemeanors, maybe with a felony or two thrown in. Alvin Bragg threw a curveball. What's that? I'm not with the Bragg case. Yeah. Mo uh, and, and, you know, Bragg, probably, and I think he did that for a strategic reason. And I think the strategic reason he did it for is this. How many of you have been on a criminal jury? Did you go all the way to the end of the jury with a verdict? Anybody go all the way to the end of the jury on a verdict? You have? A few people have. I can tell you, after leaving the U.S. Attorney's Office, I got picked to be on a criminal jury, believe it or not, and sat on that jury, and we made it all the way through. And I think the reason Bragg didn't have a mix of felonies and misdemeanors in his indictment, <clears throat> even though it's, it'd be far easier to prove the misdemeanor, far easier to prove the misdemeanor is I think he thought that gave the jury too easy a way to compromise on this case. He got some saying he's not guilty, some saying he's guilty. They meet in the middle and say, well, let's just call him guilty on misdemeanors, which jurors have done in the past. So I think the reason you see all felony is he's sort of putting it on that jury. But the misdemeanor case, like I said, it's pretty simple. False business entry, did Trump know about that false entry or not? And it's going to be, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the, the difficulty of trying this case as a lawyer. But I think what you saw was a, a prosecutor who did not want to give the jury an easy way out of this case through a compromise verdict. Now, what's going to happen between now and the end of the year? You're going to see a flurry of motions. In a criminal case, what happens, there's a big bang with the indictment, they have the arraignment, and then things kind of go underground, and the lawyers file all sorts of papers. The one that the prosecutor is most worried about at this point is the uh, legal challenge to marrying up the false business record case with the campaign finance violations case. Uh, that is a legal issue, and the legal issue is can you combine a false business entry with a uh, campaign violation, particularly a federal campaign violation? Yes, you have a question. That's what I was saying. Presuming he's guilty of a felony, which is a misdemeanor, that would be that he hasn't been charged or tried and convicted. Right. So don't they have to prove that? They have to prove he's guilty of a campaign finance violation as part of the state case. Right. Yeah. And so, so they prove a felony in the state court? Well, federal charges in the state. The same way in a federal case, you may have, they may prove a state violation against you in a federal case. I'll give you a perfect example. 
I tried a case that I have something in Texas called the Travel Act. And it's a federal crime. And if you commit a certain felonies, and they can be state felonies, um, they can try you federally on a state violation. And you just they have to present the same evidence that a state prosecutor would have to present in state court. So that's what makes it a harder case. Because I, you know, just speaking as if I were a defense lawyer, you got to worry about your credibility as a defense lawyer. I think Trump's defense lawyers are going to lose all credibility if he denies sex with Stormy Daniels. Jury's not going to buy that. Okay. Got cheated on his first wife with his second wife, cheated on his second wife with his third wife, cheated on his third wife with porn stars and paid him off to keep quiet. So that's a really good question. That's a really good question. If you can control your client, which is a big yes. He would never get anywhere near the stand. Okay. So the question is, and and you've jumped to one of the areas I was going to talk about. Trump is the ultimate problem client. Why do I say that? Not very bright, but thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. Okay. Number one. Number two, not particularly, despite the fact that he's, you know, got a history of lying, does it all the time, not very good at it. Gets caught all the time. And if you doubt that, all you have to do is go on YouTube and look at some of these depositions where Donald Trump's been grilled, you know, under oath in depositions and can't keep his story straight. So he's not going to be a good witness. Uh, he got, a, tar he got a, a target letter from Alvin Bragg. It's, it's common. He'll, he'll get a target letter from Georgia. He'll get a target letter from uh, Jack Smith on the federal side. And what that target letter says is the grand jury is considering indicting you on this day. We invite you to come to the grand jury if you want to and tell your story. You don't have to, but we invite you to come try to talk them out of it. There's no way his lawyers are ever going to let Most lawyers wouldn't let their client, but they're certainly not going to let Donald Trump. So, yeah, they'd like to keep him off the stand. The question is, what if he insists on getting on the stand? Because as a lawyer, you can give all the advice in the world to your client, but it's going to be his call. So, I mean, I just personally think that's a fascinating call. And it leads to another thing I was going to tell you. We have all these legal motions. One that I think is serious, and that's the motion to quash the indictment because you can't marry up these two statutes. That'll be a serious legal issue. If the prosecution gets over that issue, they're a long way toward home if they get over that legal issue. The issue that Trump's also raised, I'd like to talk a little bit about it, it's motion to transfer venue. He says, they hate me in New York. I didn't get any votes there. And they particularly hate me in Manhattan. Of all places in New York, this is the worst place I could be tried. So I want to transfer out of New York to Staten Island. That isn't going to work. That won't work. I mean, motions to transfer. Yes, sir. Can they unmarry the campaign finance false record? Boy, that's a great question. And I've looked into that a little bit. There's something in the law called lesser included offense. And I know it from Texas. I, I can't, can't purport to tell you I know what a New York court's going to do. But what that says is if you're charged with a, let's say, a felony here, and what you prove to the jury is not, maybe not that felony, but a lesser included offense. Can you, at the end of the case, go and stick in the jury instructions, the misdemeanor. And the misdemeanor would be false business record. And the false business record is pretty simple. False business record said, these are legal fees that were being paid by the company. When they weren't legal fees, it was hush money. It's false, slam dunk. And then the Trump people are limited to saying, well, we didn't know Michael Cohen was doing this, which I think that if they go out on that limb, the, the defense has a grave threat of losing all credibility with the jury. If they try to argue, didn't have sex with her, didn't know what Michael Cohen was doing, he was out on a lark of his own, I think that would be a disaster for the defense. Yes? It's Stormy testifying, Will Stormy Yes, can testify, 
and yes to Will testify. Stormy Daniels will testify. Uh, Michael Cohen will testify. One of the differences between a criminal case and a civil case is in a civil case, they can't compel you to travel more than 100 yards to testify. So what you get is a lot of depositions, you know, and they're taped, they're videotaped, and they play those for the jury. But a criminal case, you have the right to face your accusers. So, and, and the other difference is the prosecutors have nationwide subpoena power. They can pull you from anywhere in the nation to testify. Well, this is a st state case. So he doesn't have nationwide subpoena power, but he's got power within New York. And Stormy Daniels has already said she's coming to testify. Michael Cohen's saying he's coming to testify. So they're going to, um, they're going to absolutely be witnesses at the trial. All right. Someone asked a question about, you know, when we talked about whether Trump will testify. What the defense will try to do is keep him off the stand and get somebody to tell his story for him. You know, try to have somebody like they did in the grand jury where they sent that lawyer Costello to the grand jury. The difference in grand jury and, and trial testimony is this, though. The grand jury can hear hearsay. You can bring all sorts of hearsay in front of the grand jury. In fact, that's often all the grand jurors here are hearsay. They'll bring in an agent, and that agent will say, Joe, Joe Blow told me this, Sam Smith told me that, and just will walk through that way. In a trial, hearsay doesn't come in unless it falls within one of 13 exceptions. So they're going to have to bring those witnesses uh, to the court. Already gone. And by the way, most of them have testified to the grand jury under oath. So their testimony is kind of locked down at that point. Now, you saw all those people at the trial team sitting on uh, at the Trump be uh, bench. I think there were four trial lawyers. That could change over time. People could drop off. People could get added on. But what you didn't see is probably going to be one of the most important members of the trial team. If the prosecution gets over that legal hurdle I talked to you about, Oh, and I was going to talk about the motion transfer venue and why it really, I don't think, is much of a threat to get transferred. Generally, when those things work, it's because there's a lot of local rules. Like you have someone in Dallas who's been all over channels four, five, and eight. He's been in the Dallas Morning News. And they say, it's been tainted in Dallas, and they'll move it to Amarillo, or they'll move it to, you know, Lubbock, or something like that. Well, this is nationwide publicity. There's nowhere you can go where there isn't a huge amount of publicity. And Trump's argument that, well, I didn't carry in New York, it's not going to be a very strong argument to a judge anymore, by the way, than if they indict him in Washington, D.C. He's not going to like that jury either. Trust me. Um, they're not going to move it because he lost Washington, D.C. by what, 93 to 6 or whatever it was. So, um, but the MVP on that team is going to be interesting. I'd love to know who gets selected for this, and he or she ought to get their money up front, too. And that's going to be the jury consultant. Because what they're going to end up doing, and I'd give anything to be a fly on a wall in this, is they'll hire some hotshot jury consultant, and he or she is going to mock try this case. Maybe mock try it once, maybe mock try it twice, three times, no matter how many. They'll mock try it without Trump testifying. They'll mock try it with Trump testifying. And the goal of a mock trial is to get a jury as close to the jury you're ultimately going to get. You'll spend a day, you'll spend two days with them. You'll put on the evidence. And the most fascinating part of the law is just sitting back and seeing what they think is important, what they don't think is important as a lawyer, I tell you, as a prosecutor or defense lawyer, I don't get to see that. But I do mock try my trials now when the client's got enough, you know, resources to justify it. And it's fascinating what jurors latch on to. It's fascinating what jurors just completely dismiss and let go. Often it's a huge surprise. Um, but they're going to mock try this case. It's rare for the prosecutor to do it. They generally don't have the budget to do it. I was U.S. attorney for eight years in the Northern District of Texas. We mock tried one case, and I got my buddy at the time, 
Dr. Phil to be our, our uh, jury consultant. It's right before Dr. Phil became Dr. Phil. Oh. You know, he had signed up to do his show and he was out in LA, but he hadn't really, it hadn't gone on the air yet. So I caught him at a weak moment. He agreed to do it. We could never afford, I could even, Dr. Phil now, but he was he was our my, uh, our jury consultant at the time. But the prosecutors generally don't have one. Uh, they may find the resources to have one in a case like this. And why is that? Because what you should be looking for in a jury, in a juror, is somebody who can legitimately say, I'm going to decide this evidence based upon what I, I'm going to decide this case based upon the evidence that's come in the courtroom, the admissible testimony and the documents. And both sides should want that. But in a case like this, what you're always frightened of as a prosecutor is the so-called stealth juror, the juror who's willing to lie his way onto that jury and has absolutely no intent whatsoever, regardless of what comes in to vote to convict, or alternatively, to vote to acquit. So both sides are going to be trying to smoke that out, that juror out, and identify that juror. You know, it's a pretty good sign that if someone's trying real hard to get on the jury, you don't want him on the jury, you know. And I just had this exercise. My, my wife's here, Regina, and we were lucky enough to be in London. How many of you? I'm going to give you a quiz. Next to the Bible, who sold more books in the English language than anyone else? William Shakespeare. Shakespeare. Or... <laughs> James Patterson. Y'all are all close, huh? Y'all are all close. Agatha Christie. Oh. Agatha Christie. Next to the next to the Shakespeare's got the most quotes. He's got more quotes. He's put, contributed more words and phrases of the English language than anyone else. But my wife and I were lucky enough to go see a play in London called Witness for the Prosecution. Anybody ever see that movie, Witness for the Prosecution? Okay, I did too, when I was a kid growing up. And I got fortunate when I saw it the first time to be picked to be one of the jurors. So this is a, a great fun, except I had seen the movie. So I know the twist at the end. I know what happens. I know, I know. I won't tell. I won't say the twist. But what I had to do was was uh, psychologically say, okay, wipe that out and just base my verdict on what I hear. And, and I think I was able to do that. But but of course, it wasn't a real case. But by the way, if you get a chance to see that play, it's a crackling good play. But, but that's what you're looking for in a juror, someone who can listen to the judge's instructions and decide based upon that. And jury selection is going to be the key for both sides of this. And basically for the prosecution, like I said, you're going to really want to be concerned that there are going to be some people who are going to try to say whatever they think you want to hear to get on that jury. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my my experience with engineers is is I mean, this is no offense. In fact, it's probably good. They are very um, tuned in to the the, uh, the different elements of the crime. I mean, you know, you got to prove every. You're, you're supposed to prosecute to prove every element beyond a reasonable doubt. And I think I found that. Uh, in talking to jurors after that, which sometimes we get to do, by the way, is the engineers are often the ones who keep them on track. Okay, what about element one? What do they have under element one? Well, no, this is an engineer's mindset, you know? Uh, they're very structural. Um, so um, I mentioned uh, Trump. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, the question is: Are the prosecutors at the? Are they obligated to pay the expenses of those who come to testify? And the answer is yes. There is a fund to get airfare, and put them up, not first class airfare, coach airfare, and uh, put them up in a hotel 
uh, for as long as they're there. Um, so there is there is that, and there's some you know compensation for the jurors, but not a lot of compensation for the jurors. But the other reason you don't want to call Trump as a witness is, um, you know, you're facing one type of crime now. Do you really want to risk facing a perjury charge down the road? Because if you get up on that witness stand, you are under oath and you face uh, perjury charges. And as I said, you don't have to go very far. I mean, you can look at some of the, the deposition testimony where Trump's just been ripped to shreds and his credibility was pretty bad for a deposition. For someone who's been deposed as much as often as he has, not a very good, good witness. And you might say, well, you're under oath in a deposition too. And that is true. But frankly, nobody gets prosecuted for lying in a deposition. And I think that's the reason for that is if we prosecuted everybody that lied in a civil deposition, we'd never have time for anything else. I mean, I can tell you, I was a uh, U.S. attorney for eight years. I was an assistant for four years case where anyone was ever prosecuted for allegedly lying during a civil deposition. Now, where that is different, though, is if you, as I said, if you lie to an agent outside of deposition, but if you're being questioned in, a, in a, an investigation, those cases are brought all the time. But a perjury case in court, if a judge refers that to the prosecutors, which judges will do, if they think someone's perjured himself in a trial, civil or criminal, and if the judge refers it for probably seriously. Do they wait until the end of the trial? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Although it if a judge thinks a witness is going off the, you know, departing or is in danger of departing or, or potentially faces criminal uh cases, the judge will outside the presence of the jury give that person a warning generally and say, you know, you have the right not to testify. And, and particularly if the lawyers are advising him not to testify uh, and you're under oath and, you know, give him all sorts of warnings uh, before he testifies. So and I've seen judges do that. So but in terms of actually referring it to the prosecutor's office, I've never seen that happen during a trial. It's always been in the aftermath of a trial. And it's, and it's fairly rare for a judge to do that, in part because. The prosecutors are right there. It's just if the judge refers it, that's a little bit stronger push on the the government to do something about it. So um, one question I mentioned taxes. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to move too far from the Zoom screen. I mentioned the tax issue, the big tax tax issue that I think the Trump and the Trump family kind of dodged because the statute of limitations on tax. It's generally six or seven years, and I think a lot of it happened early on. But there's an interesting question about these this hush money payment that I don't know the answer to, and that was how, how did the Trump organization treat those payments on its state and federal income tax returns? And I think it kind of hurts Trump either way. If Trump treated those hush money payments as um, legal expenses on his tax returns, that makes him vulnerable, perhaps under state and federal tax laws. If he didn't treat them as business expenses, and now he's claiming, well, they were legitimate business, they were legal expenses, the question sort of becomes, well, if they really weren't hush money and they really were legal expenses, why didn't you treat them? as legal expenses at the time. So I think I think to some extent, Trump might be caught uh, either way. And I don't know how that's, I, I don't know how he treated him. Yes. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, yes or no. I mean, I don't know. I haven't read anything that, that says how he's treated on the state. And the federal tax returns are, as you know, super secret. Uh, so I don't know what they did with it, quite frankly. Um, if he did not reporting it, 
is better than putting it down as uh, a legal expense. I, I think. I mean, it, it's it's uh, yeah. I would not want to create a tax issue right now. Another question that's come up a lot is how does Trump get away with talking about all this stuff? How does Trump get away with you know shooting his mouth off uh, about this? You know, the baseball bat with the prosecutor, all that stuff. I think uh, he is getting away with quite a bit, but I don't even get away with it forever. I mean, I think this judge is going to bend over backwards. I do think uh, a gag order is uh, highly likely in this case. It's probably just a matter of time. Interestingly enough, though, a gag order is really directed to the parties and their counsel. A gag order doesn't really extend to non-parties. So even if Donald uh, Trump is kind of muzzled to some extent by the gag order, his sons would apparently be free to keep posting stuff that they that they post. Um, we talked a little bit about, let's talk a little bit about obstruction because that's an issue that's come up and particularly with, you know, Congress doing something that's kind of, uh, well, it, it is really pretty unique to have Congress investigating a state prosecutor. Our system is a system of two sovereigns. We've got the federal sovereign, we've got the state sovereign. And, you know, people talk about double jeopardy all the time. Guess what? Double jeopardy doesn't stop the feds from prosecuting you and the state for prosecuting the exactly same thing. I mean, Oh, like the Bundy King case. Yes, absolutely. Does it stop? Huh? Does not stop. That's right. So, so you can really be, and 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 the theory is there are two sovereigns here. There's the state sovereign. There's the federal uh, sovereignty. So, for to have the feds basically, you know, trying to investigate this state DA during the course of a criminal proceeding. Uh, um, is not just unheard of, but is arguably an obstruction of the investigation. So, you know, do I think they're going to be charged? No, but technically, you know, it, it's a bad look. You know about this judge? Um, you know about this yeah, what little I know about the judge is he enjoys a pretty good reputation on the bench. Um, he's been pretty i would say level-headed so far and and we're going to know a lot more about him according to what i've read the office has prosecuted a number of these false business entry cases so this is not the first case of this kind they prosecuted it may be the first that brings in camp federal campaign finance laws and i know the federal campaign finance laws Fairly well. Can't say I know the state campaign law, so I don't know how well they track up. But um, yeah, I mean, supposedly the guy's got experience. He's considered pretty level headed. I know several lawyers in New York said we've tried cases in front of him and he's a good trial judge. So he is going to try to, you know, the one thing a judge fears is losing control of the courtroom. That's obviously a danger here. You've got not just Trump, but you've got a lot of really flamboyant. Yeah, try they, they the judge completely lost uh, control of the courtroom in the OJ case, and I mean, and I tried a case once where, uh, you know, it was the first criminal case the federal judge tried, and you know he became a, a fine. I'm not going to mention his name. Became a very fine federal judge, but it was his first one, and he had a lot of you know racehorse hangs, and he had some of these hotshot criminal defense lawyers, kind of lost control of the courtroom, and. Uh, judges fear that. I don't think this judge is going to let that happen. I, I think ultimately, but but I do think this judge is going to weigh the legal issues pretty carefully. And if Trump's folks lose that legal issue, um, boy, I don't like Trump's chances uh, at trial. And and you raised a good question that does this judge judge allow the lesser included offense instruction to go to the jury 
which presents them with the, even though it wasn't indicted, presents them with the option of going with a misdemeanor here. Because I'm a little surprised that Bragg didn't throw in a few misdemeanors just because to me, those are almost slam dunks. You don't need, <laughs> you don't need that final step hook it up to a campaign violation. You, you just need that to convert it to a felony. And speaking of that, you know, a lot of people have written, well, so what? So he gets convicted of one count or two counts or 34 counts or whatever. Um, he's just going to get fined. That's not at all clear. I mean, I've seen uh, people say that, no, they think if he's actually hot on felonies, He's looking at multi years, and you got to remember, Cohen did prison time for essentially the same offense. So that's one of the things the judge looks at in sentencing: is that do I have a is there a track record of what other people have got in this? Uh, Pecker, the guy in the uh, release and kill, has immunity. He got immunity on this. Oh, by the way, he'll have to be a witness as well too because he's got immunity. So, uh, you know, we've talked about uh, the ultimate sanction, the timing of the trial. And I kind of mentioned this before, but I'll kind of uh, repeat it at this point. I just don't see any of these trials as wrapping up prior to the election. So, you know, I don't purport to be a political guru. I do a lot of legal work, but how this impacts the Republican primary to have a guy under indictment, not once, not twice, but perhaps three times by the time the election rolls around. Because I don't think either Georgia or Jack Smith are going to wait until after the election. I think they go forward uh, at this point. And I'll also share with you just one thing that was just kind of interesting. Last week when the indictment came down, we have a group called the National Association of Former U.S. Attorneys. And we meet in a big conference once a year, about 300 former U.S. attorneys get together, about half of us Democrat, about half Republican. And we have different, you know, uh, and then we have the Trump group and Bush one and Bush two, and, you know, Obama group. And while we're at our conference and we try not to have fist, open fist fights and the thing, we try to be, you know, uh, you know, get along with everybody, get along. You know, we all sort of had the same job for a while. Uh, but it was so interesting because the indictment of Trump came down during our conference in California. And I said, man, I would pay any amount of money to be at the Trump dinner. I want to leave the Clinton dinner and hear what happened at the Trump dinner <laughs> to see how they were handling this. But but anyway, it's going to be uh, fascinating. And I wouldn't completely be surprised to see Jack Smith come down with an indictment on the documents case that hopscotch is over the uh, earlier file case or cases and goes to trial first. That's a, that's a possibility. And I will just say one thing. If someone asked about, you wouldn't let Trump testify, would you? Of course, I wouldn't if I had control over the client. But the second thing is, if, you know, if he got convicted of a felony, whatever that felony was, uh, that's something you carry with you to the next trial, the trial after that. They don't get to mention the felony if you don't take the stand. If you do take the stand, then they get to bring out a felony if it occurred within the last 10 years. So, so yeah, that's another reason that if he gets convicted on one, you know, he's not gonna get up on the stand and testify in a later trial and have to you know, admit to the jury he's a felon, although how many jurors are really not gonna know that. But, but I will say this, you would be amazed. Sometimes jurors don't read the paper, they don't watch TV. And, but anyway, that's that's sort of, you know, yeah, I'll open up to questions. So at some point, if he's convicted as felon, whether he's playing as a candidate or mm -hmm. starting as president, what does that do to his status? Can you repeat that question? Yeah, the question is, what does it do to his status if he's convicted of a um, felony? Um, I guess they would have to impeach him if he, he were elected president. I mean, you know, I mean, I don't see any. Who knew? 
he can't vote for himself. He wouldn't be able to vote. That's right. He might have to check in with his parole officer because you have you're under even after you get out of prison. Yeah, I mean, if he were, no, it's a good question. Could you be president from prison? You know, I mean, there's. I will say this: that raises a good question because there's only been one person. Another quiz for you. Only one person in the history of the United States who's voted in the Senate to convict someone in his own party. One person in the history, that's it. Mitt Romney's it's the first person to ever vote in party. So if the Republicans control the Senate and Trump was a felon, yeah, I mean, it's, it's anybody's guess what they would do, what they would do. Any other? Oh, okay. what, what do you think about it? Saying he's going to person that Biden should Yeah, yeah, that's to me, I mean, I, I was mentioning to somebody earlier that that really um, rubs me the wrong way because- You run a law order. Yeah, they run on law and order, and 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 frankly, I'm on the appellate. Full disclosure, I'm on the appellate amicus brief for Crystal Mason, and I know y'all probably uh, have heard about Crystal Mason, but she's got a distinction too. She's the only person in history we found who's been convicted for casting a, a provisional ballot. So she cast that provisional ballot, huh? For five years. Yes, convicted for five years. But I mean, the only person ever charged, because the, the the theory behind a provisional ballot is, I don't know if I can vote, so I'll do the provisional ballot. And if it turns out I can't, they throw it out. If it turns out I can, they they count it. Well, they they ran the, the numbers and decided she couldn't. And by the way, Texas makes it really hard to know um, whether you, you know, once you're out, whether you're of, off supervised release and can vote or not. So... She cast provisional ballot and became the first person in history to be charged, convicted, and sentenced to five years. So I'm on that amicus brief, and we have some hope. But Abbott's never lifted a finger to talk about, um, you know, pardoning a woman who never should have been charged with it. I mean, never should have been charged with crime. And oh, one last thing I would say, and someone needs to do this. Like I said, right now we're in the midst of this whole Trump you know, saga and the criminal cases that are going to roll out and the criminal trials that are going to be the trials of the century, those kind of things. We're right in the middle of it. But at the end of the day, there has to be a case study done of how somebody got away with so much criminality yeah. for so long and didn't get called to account. And, you know, I, I love the Justice Department. I worked there 12 years. But Something seriously went wrong here. Yeah, I mean, something seriously went wrong with the system because I saw people all the time get prosecuted, you know, for stealing from charities, for defrauding people. And uh, this guy just got away with it for so long that uh, it someone has to step back and, and see how it happened. Uh, started with this five... That, the, the biggest tax case was, you know, sending $400 million down without paying taxes on it. So, but, but I mean, just like I said, as a federal prosecutor, I just saw too many prosecutions where you ended up talking about marrying up. You'd marry up the loan applications where your property was worth billions and billions of dollars. It was worthless, you know, and, and, They'd both be done at around the same time, and the feds would come in and say, no, no, that's a no-no, you can't do that, that's a felony. And people got prosecuted right and left for that, and that's sort of been a way of life, uh, defrauding all sorts of folks, Trump University, the rest. So all that, all that will ultimately be taught in law school, and someone just needs to do the book on it. And as I said, I don't think the Justice Department or the IRS or the FBI comes out looking good in this over over time. But yes, sir. Right. 
she got a sex worker. Mm -hmm. Michael Cohen doesn't exactly have a reputation of defense is going to go after every witness for credibility and make a bigger circus. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you gotta let him do a fair amount. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the question uh, for our Zoom audience is the question is, you know, essentially, isn't the defense going to have a field day going after attacking the credibility of Stormy Daniels, Michael Cohen? And, and I think the answer is yes. I mean, they're, they're going to be very, very good at what they did. Uh, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, I think for someone particularly like Michael Cohen, it's going to be, well, someone like Trump is not going to hire somebody. He's not going to hire, you know, Mother Teresa to work in the Trump organization. This is the kind of person Trump's going to hire. Um, and, and, you know, that's not dissimilar from a lot of other criminal cases. Yeah, it's, it's very, very similar to a lot of criminal cases where the prosecution's witnesses, they're not who you would pick. Uh, they were who were who were there, you know, and so that's that's ultimately what they're going to do, and and the jury will get an instruction. It's a standard instruction that essentially if the defendant doesn't testify, it's not entitled to doesn't testify. You can't hold that uh, against him or her, you know. Uh, don't take that into account in your deliberations. I doubt there's any jury that's ever actually followed that instruction, but it's given in every criminal case where a defendant doesn't testify. So, um, so there will be a lot, it, a lot of fireworks uh, in the trial. The documents case, the fact that Biden had some records, they will use them. They, nope. They make money nope. To true that. Nope. 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 If the judge is on his feet, the judge is going to say, "Oh, I'm sorry. Good. Good." The, the question was, in the documents case, can the Trump people bring up that Biden had some documents, Pence had some documents, you know, other politicians had some documents. Another standard instruction in a criminal case, you're not here to deliberate on anyone's guilt but this gentleman right here, nobody else. So if, if the judge is running the courtroom, he doesn't let that in. Now, does the defense try to sneak it in? Heck yeah, the defense might try to sneak it in. But what the prosecutor do is they'll file what's called a motion in limine at the start of the trial. And the motion in limine will say, you're not allowed to bring up all these other cases without <laughs> approaching the judge first. And the judge will grant that motion to limine. And so that'll keep the defense from doing it. And if the defense violates that, then they violated a court order and they're in deep, deep trouble. So um, yeah, the answer is, they shouldn't be able to. Uh, they'll try to somehow work it in. The interesting thing about the documents case is the judge has already um, found the crime fraud exception to the attorney client uh, privilege and is going to force that attorney to testify against Trump. So the, re the whole reasoning behind that, and the attorney can be entitled in it. I represented a law firm one time. Interesting case. It was a tax, uh, it was tax fraud case uh, investigation, and the lawyers I end up representing were representing a person who was being investigated for tax fraud. Well, these lawyers found a bunch of great documents that were great for their client. You know, these were very exculpatory documents. So they provided those to the prosecution. They, you know, pursue it to a grand jury subpoena. This is great stuff for us well unbeknownst to the lawyers the defendant and the secretary had concocted had written up all those documents the night before they were due to the grand jury they were all false documents and the prosecutor unwittingly unknowingly turned over false documents to the grand jury and it was proven well the lawyers crime fraud exception the lawyers had to get up on the stand where'd you get those documents we got them from our client you know, and uh, that was, and that's what is happening in the documents case here. You might remember there was a lawyer they tried to get to write that letter and sign that letter saying we've done an exhaustive search and we found nothing. And she said, ah, I don't think so. She did not sign that letter. Uh, and, but some lawyer had did pass along that information. 
And I'm sure what that lawyer's going to say, because he's covering his ass, right? Is that I got this from my client. And so what I told him was based upon what I was told. And so that's why I was saying a false statement to an agent can be direct or it can be indirect. And here they're going to argue it was indirectly done. Yes, sir. So the, your old boss pretty much decided we don't invite them. But it makes sense to pass a law that says, okay, we're not going to indict somebody ever again. Ever again. But what happens is when the, if the day he takes the oath, the day he gets replaced with an oath, yes. the statute of limitations gets Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. That's a that's a great suggestion. Um, and you know, it has been. Toy know, well, Trump was there because of obvious. The, the question was, if the president, should there be a law that the statute of limitations is told for the entire time you're in office? And I think the answer to that is yeah. yes, because if you're a two-term president and the statute of limitations is five years or six years, or even seven years, uh, and you're there eight years, I'm home free, you know, at that point. Yeah, or should, well, generally there's not a statute of limitations on things like murder and things like that, but I'm thinking of bank fraud and, you know, tax fraud and those kind of cases. Um, the statute just keeps running, and, and they do have the power to toll the statute of limitations. So, yeah, I mean, I think that would, that would make it good sense if they're but but you no, know, that's always been a pretty sketchy rule, the fact that you're not gonna indict a president while he's in office. I mean it was it was yeah, it was more of a policy than based upon any statute or law. So but if if it's gonna be a policy and they're gonna hear one, yeah. take the damn law. Yeah. I'll have a question. Yes. Talk about not in this case, but I want to say first that uh, the Georgia case has to be a slam dunk. The whole country heard him say on the phone for well, one solid hour, uh, I need 12, I need 12,000. <laughs> yeah, that is, you have to pull that. I don't Documents case, I find very interesting. Yeah, the doc. Yeah. I for the federal government for three years, 25. Never touched a piece of paper that wasn't classified. And so I know a lot about the meaning of the word classified papers. I think the media has done a miserable job explaining what classification in the government means. Uh, they talk. Trump said he he was the president. He can unclassify, declassify a document. Well, you know what nobody ever said is that there isn't a document which there's only one copy. Every document, if it's secret or not secret, uh, has on the bottom of this is copy three from twenty copies. And if it's from the CIA, uh, they they have a log. Where they, they log in, where every single one of the 20 documents goes. And so if Trump uh, uh, says he can declassify what happens to the other 19, uh, I, uh, I, I've been following this thing because I know so much about classification. And uh, that should be enough to hang up, I can tell you. I was at the American Embassy in Bonn, Germany, in a classified situation. And what, you know, at every embassy, they got a Marine guard. Marines uh, at night go through the whole building and see what everybody closed their safe. But well, one night, uh, one of my guys didn't close a safe. And I got a call about 10 o'clock at night from the Marines. He said, oh, you've got a safe that's open. And, and the place was locked. I mean, you couldn't get into the place uh, uh, to see that the safe wasn't locked. And that fact that this safe is not locked went to the State Department, to the Defense <laughs> Department, and I was reprimanded uh, nicely. <laughs> uh, 
for having had a safe open for change. It was responsible for because it was my office. Yeah. You know, it's just the it, whole forget? classification thing Did has not been explained. Here's a Valentinian, you sign a document that says that. Subject to ten percent. Yeah, yeah. I'll recap a couple of because a couple of interesting points. Um, gentleman talked about the Georgia case and how that he thought that was a bit of a slam dunk. Then we got in the documents case and the classification issue. Two things about one thing about the Georgia case before I talk about the documents case. That is a damning statement that all I need is eleven thousand seven hundred eighty votes. All you need to find me is that exact number. But to me, the other one that doesn't get mentioned enough, which is equally damning, is you can just say you recounted, you know, at that point. I mean, he knows I haven't, you know. He just said, I'm giving you the number and I'm telling you how you can, you know, justify it to the uh, public. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, but it was a perfect phone call, as you know. So, uh, uh, yeah, but the documents case, it's interesting, the classification issue, um, it's a, to some extent, it's a bit of a red herring because the classifications make it a more egregious offense. Obviously, if it's you know, highly classified, top secret beyond top, but at the end of the day, it's about taking property that belongs to the United States and keeping it whether it's classified or not. So when Trump says, well, I declassified everything. Well, they're not your documents. You know, the act makes it clear they're not your documents. And so the issue is, did you take things that didn't belong to you? And then when you were questioned about it, did you lie or did you cause somebody to lie about it? And that's why the classification at the end of the day, it sort of comes into the sentencing. You know, obviously, if you sell nuclear secrets, you're you know, a bigger risk than if you hold on to logs of who signed in and who didn't sign in. But uh, the question at the back. Well, you can bet that his lawyers at some point are going to try to argue that, you know, we need uh, a continuance. We're in the middle of a trial. Oh, the question was, what happens if Don Trump gets the nomination and he's running for president at the same time he's being tried in the courtroom? Well, here's an interesting thing. You don't have to be in court when you're being tried. Not a good look for you. I mean, but in general, as a criminal in this, to be there, you don't have to be there. You know, if, and, uh, you know, I've never had a criminal defendant that I represented that wasn't sitting there because I'll always tell them that, you know, the jury's going to kind of think you're not taking this real seriously if you're not willing to sit there. And I've had a trial, a criminal trial that lasted seven months where the guy said, you know, we had to sit next to each other Monday through Friday, nine to five, you know, uh, you think you don't get sick and tired of seeing your lawyer, you know, that <laughs> often, uh, but, but, you know, you don't have to sit there in the trial. Uh, now I'm sure his lawyers at some point are going to say, we're in the middle of a hard fought campaign. All this stuff needs to be pushed off, you know, and, and then when he becomes president, if he became president, I guess he could say, I'm too busy, you know, to, to you know, to go through the trial now. So, I mean, it, 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 you know, we are really, I, I think your question is a good one, but it really goes to how uncharted um, this whole area really is and has been. I mean, you would think growing up, well, first of all, we could never have conceived that someone like Donald Trump would get elected president. I think he may be the first president, correct me if I'm wrong, who prior to running for president, never been elected to office or never been a cabinet official or never served in the military. The last one I can remember who had never been elected to anything or served on the cabinet was Eisenhower. 
and he did win World War II. So I guess we can give him a little bit of a break, you know. But I think Trump. Yeah. But the other. I, oh, yeah. Yes. What about the January 6th uh, insurrection case? And do I think it's going somewhere? I kind of don't. I mean, you know, I think it will net hundreds, maybe thousands of people who end up getting charged at the end of the day, most of whom will probably do some time. Does it get any of the folks like the president or any of the congressmen or any of those folks, I don't see that happening. And in part, I don't see it happening, essentially, especially if Trump gets charged on the documents case, if there's already a federal case out there, if there's already a couple of state cases out there, I kind of don't see them taking a flyer on that. Uh, but I, you know, I could be wrong, but that's just my gut feel. Mm -hmm. What's that? It would be easier to try something. It would, it would, but you know, then again, if he's got a couple of convictions, it, the public might think, okay, you got it. You, you dinged him once, you dinged him twice. You know, how many times are you going to keep coming after this? What is going to be 75 then or whatever? <laughs> Any, Yes. Documents case. I like that documents case. I think I think that's a, a pretty good one. Although I agree, I think the Georgia case, I just don't see the Georgia case taking all that long to put on. I mean, you know, you got a phone call, you've got the records. Um, but but I'll tell you the thing about them. The girl, whatever time you get in the federal system, you do about 80% of it. So, you know, if there's a conviction on the federal case, they talk about, well, if he gets convicted on the uh, Alvin Bragg case, he just might get probation or it might just be a fine. Could happen. I think it'd be a little bit more serious than that. But on the federal case, it's all done by guidelines. And those guidelines for false statement, they're kind of wicked. I mean, I've seen those things from both sides of the table, and they generally start at about two years. 18 months to 26 months kind of thing. So I think if he gets convicted of making a false statement to the FBI indirectly on the documents case, he's looking at a couple of years. Um, and that's 18, let's say 24 months. You do 80% of that. What's that? 19, 20 months, something like that. Yes. I would want extra money if I was a Secret Service agent for that. I think you might end up losing your Secret Service. First of all, you're, you're, you'd be protected by the Bureau of Prisons, so you'd have you'd be in the well. If you're if you're if you're a federal, if you're a federal, no, they. You know, but you're just like the lady at the back. You're raising an issue that we've never faced as a nation. Um, you know, what? where would they house him? Now, you know, the federal side, I can't, well, that's for, that, that's, that's, that's really for terrorists like that, Eric Rudolph, people like that. But the federal system, you've got high, medium, low camps. Uh, home confinement, you know, would they give Trump some camp somewhere that was, you know, yeah. it's possible. Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, someone, I can't remember who the gentleman had, was passing around the Trump Tower, and it was a prison tower. I don't know if he's still here, but, you know. Yeah, there he is. He, yeah, he's got his. He he knows where he wants to put him. But uh, but you know, on the state system, I just don't know. I mean, like I said, there's just all sorts of um, issues that we're going to face that we've never faced before. Well, yes.
Yeah, no, but I mean, I've seen proposals that say you should be stripped of your Secret Service if you're convicted of a felony. Now, I don't know if that's ever, you know, passed or, yeah. One related, one related to Ken Paxton. Is, is he in office running out statutes limitations <laughs> on some of his? Uh, The, 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 you know, that securities fraud Mr. case, oh yeah, the, this is a question about Ken Paxton and whether he's running out his um, statute of limitations. And really on the securities fraud, the answer is no, because that case has been tried. I mean, it has been indicted. So once it's indicted, um, then the statute stops. So, uh, you know, now there's something in the federal system called Speedy Trial Act. And if you don't, if you indict someone, you don't try them. You know, quickly and could lose the case. So uh, this is a difficult case because I knew the the fellow at the SEC who brought the SEC a case against him, and the Fifth Circuit threw that out. That's civil. The SEC is civil. This is a criminal case where they've got special prosecutors who've been hired to prosecute him. And they're not paying the special prosecutors. So they're basically saying, well, we're not going. Paxton's not pushing it. Uh, so uh, I, I've never seen anything like it. The case has just been moribund for what? How many years now? I mean, yeah. Well, yeah. At, at some point, you know, Paxton will raise the argument that even though we don't have a speedy trial act in Texas, you know, the government's lost its ability to try me. Uh, but those prosecutors, and I know couple of one of the prosecutors who's special prosecutor, they just stopped paying Who them. They? Um, prosecutor out of Houston named Randy Schaefer. I mean, I don't know county, commissioners, I don't know county commissioners and Collin County. And it went back and forth between Fort Worth and Collin County and Houston. Houston. And I'll cut some run Change Yes. He wants to move it to Collin County. Yeah. Yeah. Out of, yeah. But the other thing is, I just talk, since you brought up Paxson, he's also got that lawsuit filed by people in his office against him. The whistleblowers, they've offered uh, 3.3 million to settle the case. But the problem is, the legislature hasn't, hasn't appropriated that money. So there's no appropriation. For the settlement and so paxton's telling the people the plaintiffs well it's on you to get the legislature to appropriate the money i'm just going to sign the agreement you're going to let me go and then it's your job to get the legislature to do it which you know they're not going to do so well i think what the what the plaintiffs are going to say is well then let's go back to court you know we have a settlement that you're not funding. Well, the, you asked a lot of questions. I, some questions I can't answer. A lot of questions that I can't answer and I'm not sure anyone knows. We're sort of making this up as we go along at this point, but I appreciate it. And I'm happy to come back after the first trial or the second trial or the third trial. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone for attending for your questions, for all for your patience answering so many questions, even from engineers. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's easy to meet. Uh, anyway, thank you all for coming. Thank you for those of you who have renewed your membership or joined. If you haven't renewed or joined, please do it because we would like to make donations to some of the candidates as well as fund postcards. And, uh, you know, we have to pay for the post office box and the, the email and everything. So we have some small expenses. We're careful, but uh, we appreciate all of your, um, all of your, <laughs> snap out on me. Um, all of your uh, support and and uh, thank you and and again Paul was so ready to come and visit us well, tonight. Him to speak. Well, I just yeah. asked him. I just asked him. I said, you know, because that indictment came, I said, I think Paul would be good, and he just said, happy to do it. And so we were very lucky. Well, you all behave very well, so that's good. <laughs> but thank you. Yes, sorry. Sure. The people here to know that uh, Ralph has republished uh, his book. Freedom is not free. It is a documentary of the many uh, stages of his life from Germany to France, to the United States, 
Korea to uh, back to uh, Germany as uh, working as an intelligence uh, person for the United States. And uh, it's uh, called Freedom is Not Free. And uh, it's on Amazon.com. And uh, we think it's a pretty good uh, walk through history. So uh, invite you to check it out. Ralph, Ralph has a pretty amazing history in terms of in, in, Ralph Hoffman. Serving in right here because he was he was in World War II. Okay. Ralph doesn't look old enough to, but he was in he was an active uh, in World War in II. World War II as a as a um, intelligence uh, agent, but and he was, he's he's continued this activity. Yeah, you know he's like, been really I and mean, he's just kind of amazing. He worked kind of as amazing. a 14, 15 year old with the American Quakers in France as an interpreter for the refugees. I mean, art at 14, he already spoke German, French, and English. And the refugees needed all of those languages. And his family escaped and went back before the end. So uh, he's been a true American citizen. Uh, citizen uh, and his family came here. But and as he got old enough, he joined the American Army and went back to Germany before the end of it. And then he was in the Korean War. And then uh, he worked in intelligence. So it's a good read. It's a good history book. And it takes you through a whole lot of the 20th century. And mm -hmm. uh, so look it up. Freedom is not free on Amazon. Yeah. And it is that is really a very pertinent, a really pertinent thought today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, sure. Because it's happiness. This put out a documentary that's going to be seven installments. And uh, called Transatlantic, you may have heard about it. Uh, the uh, it's the story of an American by the name of Marion Fry, who went to March 1940 with a list. I don't know was the love was behind it, with a list of famous people that uh, I would stand like with, with a list of famous people. Uh, then our government, which didn't like refugees, wanted to save, so we saved hundreds of people, including such people as Mark Chagall. Uh, if you're into music, Alma Mahler, who was the, was the widow of Gustav Mahler, carried the uh, 10th Symphony, which was unfinished, across the Pyrenees uh, to get it out of the reach of the Nazis. And uh, so uh, he was, Barry uh, Fry was the great American. Uh, the, uh, I have not seen the first installment. I just found out about it. I, it's a new one. So, what's the name? Trans Atlantic. Trans Atlantic. Uh, it started on, on Friday night. Okay, great. I, I want to also mention one of our members gave us some information on, um, I copied it, and it's on a little piece of paper up there where you register with this and they let you know about all the upcoming elections and also uh, League of Women Voters that also has information about it. It automatically remind you of elections. And since we have one starting municipal elections and school board elections starting on April 24th, uh, pay attention, make sure you get out and vote because these elections are won by relatively small numbers of voters. We had a member who ran for a uh, free council in Farmers Branch in a specific precinct or district, and uh, he lost by about 100 votes. And 100 votes is not that many, yeah. not that many. So please vote. And again, when you come to the school board for CFBISD, and I, I call them a school lawyer. I mean, he's a lawyer for school, right? Well, you can you explain lawyer, it, rest. School lawyer, education lawyer. I'm writing, and I have yard signs here if anybody wants one. I have literature, uh, but we'll be getting out the vote and working hard to uh, to get a seat on this.
Oh, mm -hmm. and got the Dallas Morning News uh, recommendations. Yay. Yeah. 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 We've got the Dallas Morning News recommendation. So, well, anybody think or, 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 but you're still welcome, even if you don't read your membership or join. Yes, it's council PCA. Yeah, right. The what, Nancy? Nancy Watson, Multi Purpose Center for the State District in Irving. I'll give you the All right. It's all the school boards in the area? Oh, uh, no, it's uh, just for school PCA. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, Wes just said that there's a, uh, a forum tomorrow night. The Nancy, Nancy Watson Center in Irving for CFBISD, if you're interested. Okay, well, thank you all. I'm going to, we can discontinue the Zoom, please. And